Our speaker has been a good friend because uh, he represents Peak Performers, which has been a, a sponsor of Launchpad for a long time. Many of you know Miles Wallace. <clears throat> he used to be a recruiter, but now don't you have a different title? Uh, yeah, I am the. Uh, I kind of have a combination of jobs. Uh, I do outside recruiting, so coming and talking to folks like yourself at events. Um, they also do digital marketing, and I do business development for the company too. So we are, by the way, we are actually looking for an internal IT recruiters. So okay, Doki. Yeah. Uh, I have something good to tell at the end of this about your recruiting system. And uh, so he's going to be talking about tracking systems. Be one with the bots. He works for Peak Performers, a nonprofit staffing firm that's been in business since 1994. They staff for state of Texas government agencies with office personnel, accounting, and IT roles. Uh, Miles views his own role as changing the world one job at a time. At Peak Performers, he is involved in both recruiting and business development, a perfect complement to his background in B2B sales and digital marketing. Proud to call Austin his home. Outside of work, he enjoys hobby board games, bike riding, and swimming. Without any further delay, Miles Wallace. <laughs> Hi everyone, my name is Miles and I'm with Peak Performers and I want to thank you so much for having me out here today. Um, first off, just a quick kind of gauge of the room, who here has heard of Peak Performers? <coughs> oh good, okay, so I see about a third of the crowd right here is, uh, has uh, worked with Peak Performers before. Um, I hope that you've had a good experience. Uh, my job primarily is to go out in the community and talk with folks like yourself and generally kind of uh, drum up interest in Peak Performers. Um, just so you all know, as far as the designation of roles, we also have an internal recruiter named Meredith, and her job is to process all the resumes. So just so you know kind of the way that we work, um, she's the one that actually puts eyeballs on every single resume. That is our contact information, though, so feel free to reach out to us. Um, we take all of our resumes online at peakperformers.org. By the way, who wants to know what kind of jobs we are currently recruiting for? Okay, that's always kind of like a hot button for everybody, isn't it? As I mentioned, um, IT recruiter is a big one for us right now. We are looking for an IT recruiter specifically that has experience within that field. Um, we are looking for a public health and uh, prevention specialist, an epidemiologist, any epidemiologists in the room? Rats, okay, I'm always looking for that one right there. Um, somebody that has uh, experience within that field and also has experience working with big data. We're looking for a grant coordinator and a contract specialist, most multiple contract specialist roles. And then finally, we're looking for a part-time actuary. Um, that particular role plays 90, uh, $95 an hour. And um, as far as like a kind of get me by right now job, it's a really good one to look at, so. Without it, yeah. <laughs> Without any further ado, I want to take a couple of seconds. I know that some people have already heard of us, but I'm just going to cover a little bit more about what Peak Performers is and how we started. Peak Performers was founded in 1994, and we were founded with the unique um, goal of basically helping people with disabilities and chronic medical conditions get jobs and professional jobs. Um, we were actually uh, founded as an offshoot of St. Vincent de Paul Rehabilitation Service. Anybody heard of that service before? Okay, cool, perfect. Um, and while they supplied a lot of jobs for the area, they didn't supply a whole lot of professional jobs. They did mostly manufacturing. And so we specialize in those office professional, financial, and IT kinds of roles. Um, so uh, I want to talk a little bit more about, well, um, quick note right here. All of our jobs are eight to five Monday through Friday with a couple of exceptions, but that's the vast majority of the role. Um, and when you work for us, you work for us as a W-2 employee, not a 1099 contractor. Um, why is this difference important? Well, it means that we give you health insurance after 60 days. Um, it also means that um, should uh, you be between assignments, um, you'd get unemployment benefits as well. That's always kind of a worst case scenario, but that's the importance of working for a contract. Yeah, go ahead, Kathy. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you. Yeah. Uh, is it still true that if you don't find qualified people with a disability, 
disabilities and then you consider uh, people without disabilities? We are. So let's, let's talk about that right there. So let's talk about our mission. Uh, thank you for that. So currently, um, we are required by law to have 75% of our folks have a disability or chronic medical condition. Um, currently, we're at 89%, so the vast majority of our candidates currently do have a disability. But I want to actually talk about what uh, a disability is. A disability includes, what's the first thing that comes to your mind? Real quick, up, up here in the front row. What's the first thing that comes to your mind as far as a disability? Wheelchair, okay, that's the most iconic one, right? Because that's what we see as a picture everywhere. Hearing. What else? Hearing. hearing impairment, okay, I actually self-identify. I have a severe high frequency hearing loss. I have to make really good eye contact with people. Yeah. What else? Blindness. Blindness, okay, that's a very common one. Um, what else? Missing limb. Missing limb, okay, so now what I'm hearing right here, these are all very good examples and these are totally qualifying conditions. However, that is only a part of the puzzle. Um, Invisible disability is what we often refer to it, and those are the non-observable or non-obvious disabilities that an individual may have. For example, I have severe high frequency hearing loss. I make do with being able to make really good eye contact with people, and I move around the room so I can hear you a little bit better and watch your lips. Um, who here um, knows somebody that might have ADHD or dyslexia? Who here knows somebody that might have PTSD? Who here knows somebody that might be a cancer survivor? Okay, so this is the kind of the example of those invisible disabilities and how surprisingly common they are. Um, we take our definition of a disability actually from the Americans with Disabilities Act. Um, so that's where we pulled all that information from. Who we're looking for? We are looking for office professional, we're looking for financial and accounting, and we're looking for information technology kinds of roles. That is the vast majority of our roles. Some of our most hot jobs that come for, up for us on a frequent occasion are things like accountants, auditors, contract specialists, grant coordinators. Those are some of our most common jobs. On the IT side, we get a lot of project manager kinds of roles and business analyst kinds of roles. What I often tell people is that a recruiting cycle can be very, very short. So what I encourage you to do is send us your resume ahead of time at peakperformance.org um, in order to join our talent pool. Um, and that helps us keep you in mind for future job consideration. <coughs> Um, so, as far as working with Peak, um, we already kind of talked about this a little bit, but 75 to 80% of our staff have a disability. Um, our roles are temporary, however, each year 25 to 40% of our folks go on to get hired full-time by the agencies that they work for. We are often seen as a foot-in-the-door opportunity within those agencies, and we do offer health insurance, um, employee recognition programs. Um, in fact, we actually just recognized our employee of the year, um, a gentleman by the name of Eric. Um, Eric is legally blind, and he works as an EIR accessibility tester. So he's a fantastic story um, of just kind of uh, all the way that he's come. Yeah, go ahead. Um, you went through the disabilities pretty quickly. I was sure. just wondering where bipolar and schizophrenia about. That is absolutely, yeah. So any kind of uh, mental disorder um, uh, or any kind of like depression, bipolarity, schizophrenia, um, anything like that is absolutely a qualifying condition. Yes. Any other questions along those lines? But then if you have a job opening and you don't have anybody with <coughs> or invisible, mm -hmm. then you have a small percentage of that Correct. Have no disabilities that you can also refer on. Absolutely, yeah, we do. And we look at all candidates. Um, typically, what will happen is we will um, consider those candidates if we have like a really, really specialized role that's very incredibly difficult okay. to find somebody. Yeah, exactly, exactly, yeah. <laughs> so it does come up for us. Um, that's just our mission, and that's what we're looking for. Okay, so anybody that's interested, uh, send us your resume, peakperformers.org. That's how we take all of our jobs. Um, Meredith will typically reach out back out to people within about a week. Um, she reaches back out to the people that uh, exhibit the kind of re uh, strengths on their resume that we're looking for. Um, so don't take it personally if she doesn't get back to you. However, what I do promise is that if you reach out to her or if you reach out to me, we are happy to give you any feedback on, a re on the resume and say, hey, so the reason that we may not have contacted you is this, or this is really what we're looking for, or can you give us a little bit more details on this? Who here feels like in the job search process Process that their resume goes into a black hole. Oh no, okay. I never want you to feel that way with peak performers. So my commitment is that at the very least, we are happy to provide you feedback um, so you never have to wonder what happened with the resume, what happened with my job application. Okay, so applicant tracking systems and resume optimization. Who here feels fantastic about applicant tracking systems? Who here loves it like capital L-O-V-E? 
No? Okay. Well, I'm going to actually present to you guys. I, I, I see that you're laughing in the front row right here. Um, I'm going to present you a little bit more with the employer's uh, standpoint and why employers use uh, uh, applicant tracking systems. I will tell you that as of um, 10 years ago, uh, the way that we kept track of all resumes was a filing drawer. We kept all of our, yeah, sure, you're nodding your head in the front row. Is that how you did it before? Exactly. Um, so that's kind of how the way things used to be. However, it is estimated, I was reading this recently, that it was uh, for each job opening, um, an, an average employer will get 250 applicants per job. And just to give you kind of a little bit more perspective, the average recruiter for a larger organization, not necessarily peak performance, but a larger organization, spends about seven seconds on each resume. That's a lot of stuff to get through, that's a lot. Um, so there's a lot of power with the internet, with making it accessible to everybody, um, making it so that you can very easily see all the jobs that are available, but there's a trade-off too. Um, and really what I want to give you guys this perspective on is how not necessarily to beat the system, but to optimize for the system. Who here is familiar with search engine optimization? Okay, cool, I see we some, have some uh, marketing people in the room right here, that's fantastic. Um, I uh, come from a background of doing SEO kinds of work, um, and so I will be making reference to that. By the way, uh, feel free, um, as John did up in the front row right here, stop me if you have any questions. Um, I will try to keep my presentation down to about like 45 minutes or so, just so you guys have some extra time, and then I'll leave it open for questions at the end. So, most uh, HR departments use an applicant tracking system, also called an ATS. Um, these help us keep track of resumes, candidate correspondence, and people uh, in order to find kind of the skills listed on their resume and match that up with the job. ATS reliant recruiters like myself use keywords to pair candidates with a job. Why does this matter? Well, many recruiters shift through many, many resumes for a particular job. Uh, many candidates that apply for a job do not possess the minimum qualifications. This is really important and this is why recruiters might spend only seven seconds on a resume because they can very quickly and easily tell, hey, this person is not a business analyst. Not gonna be a fit for this particular role right here. Um, estimated that uh, people spend on average six or seven seconds and many resumes um, are not even seen unless the computer deems them relevant. Okay, what affects your particular rank? And we're gonna be covering all this a little bit in more detail as well too. But keyword frequency, so, and we're gonna talk about keywords as well. Um, keyword recency, job titles, because those are seen as the most pertinent information. And then also location. So candidates that are physically located closer to the job site are probably going to be prioritized. Why do you think that is? Any, anybody come from a background in HR? What's that? Okay, why, why do you think that that is that, they might, uh, that we might consider or an applicant tracking system might consider and rank higher people that are closer to the job site? What's that? It reduces costs. It's also less likely that the candidate will back out during the recruiting process too um, because what happens a lot of times is they'll be looking for something a little bit closer to home. So this is all really important information just to kind of keep in mind when you're doing this. Um, and I will tell you right now that peak performers, for example, for the, most, for the majority of the time, we do not consider candidates outside of the Austin metro region. Um, and the reason for that is that we've just had too many problems with them being able to start on time, um, being able to satisfy the customers as well. So um, I'm not saying that it doesn't happen, I'm saying that it's a little bit more rare. And that is one of those hurdles, but we're gonna talk about how to get past those hurdles. Oh, What's that? Uh, what is that? Map that. <laughs> what's, the, what's the map? What's that look like? Um, I'll show you an example in a second, but basically like um, I typically plug in 50 miles. Um, so like I do a 50 mile radius around, uh, around Austin, but that's not a hard and fast rule. Um, typically recruiters will look for folks a little bit closer and centralized um, and then start branching out afterwards as well. Um, for really hard to find uh, skill sets, for example, we recently hired on a project manager that moved from Portland, Oregon. Um, he had some really, really specific skill sets that we just couldn't find anywhere else, so. Okay, finally, uh, what we notice, um, the number one thing that I notice as a recruiter is your experience. Um, so I know that uh, the tendency is to sometimes like keep resumes a little bit shorter, but what I would encourage all of you to do is if your resume is relevant to the job, 
and the stuff that's listed on your resume is relevant to the job, I want you to include it. Please, by all means, because the very first thing, if you watch a recruiter's eyeball, the very first thing that they do is they look to see your name, they look to see the brief overview, and then they immediately jump right to the experience. Keyword frequency, because similar to how computers read your resume, we will also read your resume in a very similar way. We're gonna be skimming for keywords. We're gonna be saying, oh, so does this person business analyst? How many times does this appear on the resume? And uh, in a way, we're actually kind of deeming it more relevant based off of that as well. We're looking for keyword matching, and we're also looking for certifications. Certifications often kind of serve two particular kind of advantages for you. The first thing is that let's say I have a wide pool of candidates um, and I post a job out there for a project manager and I get 500 responses. It, you're laughing back there, but that is a very real example that happens to us a lot. Um, so now what we might be able to do is we might be able to limit that field back a little bit and even if the job description doesn't call for a PMP, we might plug that in there in order to get that from 500 down to 50 or something like that. Um, but the biggest thing that we are looking for, and this is what we're gonna talk about the most, is tailoring your resume. Who here takes the time every time that they submit for a job to tailor their resume? How long does that take for you? Hours. Hours? Yeah, it can feel like that, doesn't it? And I'm gonna try to hopefully give you some feedback so you can narrow that down and make it to where it's a little bit more targeted each time that you do it, but it can take a lot of time. There is an enormous trade-off, but typically I see that the best results are taking the time to really tailor to that resume. First, you gotta find a job that's absolutely spot on fit for you, and then you take the time to really, really tailor that resume. So, my next steps for tailoring a resume, thank you, Jill, for volunteering, I, uh, um, is what we're gonna do is we're going to actually tailor our resume today using these five steps right here. Um, number one, highlight job description. Number two, insert keywords multiple times. Uh, number three, update your job summary. And then number four, move the pieces around to be relevant. And number five, minimize slash remove extra content. Let's talk about that first bit here. Okay, now I need some uh, audience participation right here. Um, what we're gonna be doing is we're gonna be highlighting some of the different jobs, uh, some of the different keywords in this uh, job description right here. What do you see? What do you see, John? What would you highlight if you are me and you are having to find somebody very, very quickly? Business analyst. Okay, what else? BI. Which, what was that back there? Okay, yeah. What else? SharePoint. SharePoint. Okay, what else? Okay, yeah. All, the, all this is very good right here. So you're pulling out very similar kinds of stuff to what I would highlight in the job description. This is how typically recruiters work, is what happens is our HR manager will give us a job description and say, hey, I need you to find this person. And so what we do is we immediately print that job description off and then we physically highlight it and then we use those keywords to plug it in to search for somebody. Um, by the way, just so uh, we can kind of cover this, um, the job description that we're using for an example today is I'm looking for a business analyst in Austin. I want to find somebody with a background working for the state and would prefer that they have experience with healthcare. Um, I want to find somebody uh, with experience using business intelligence and SharePoint software, and I want to find somebody that can start quickly. Okay. So this is what it would look like. By the way, I can't actually show you our applicant tracking system just due to proprietary stuff. Um, however, this is actually a screenshot of what Monster looks like from the employer end, and this is how we're, do it, uh, how we're doing it on the back end. Um, Monster is basically a giant applicant tracking system that many, many people share. So you're already using an applicant tracking system, if you will. So as you can see in the job title right here, I plug in business analyst. Um, this is where I can actually specify and say how far of a range do I want. So I could say within 50 miles, but I could also say no range, or I could say 100 miles or 20 miles. Um, I can also specify what I'm looking for as far as keywords, and I can either make them required or nice to have. So I have state, SharePoint, um, BI, which is short for business intelligence, and if I'm a recruiter, I'll probably actually plug in both of those interchangeably. And then I'm also looking for somebody with experience in healthcare. Um, now you'll also notice that I plugged in something, what's that? Oh, that was nice one. Okay, yeah. Um, you also notice right here that um, I want resumes that have been updated within the last three months. Why is this important for me? Okay, exactly. Um, now, the challenging part about being a recruiter and everything is that um, 
surprisingly, uh, when we reach out to candidates uh, that we find online, um, the majority of them are no longer available. It's just kind of the way it is. Um, so what you can do is you can routinely update your resume on Monster. Don't just assume that because I put it up there, I throw it out there, that it's good forever. Continually update it, continually work on it, test. Anybody, I know that we had a couple of marketing people in the room. Here, who here has heard of A-B testing? What is A-B testing, Brian? When you take two different versions of something, like for example, a web page, yep. and you show them two different sets of people, and you see what the reaction is, and see which one is better. Absolutely. And you'll often change very small details too. Um, but what I encourage people to do is, hey, think outside the box. Maybe you could take your resume, and maybe you have two versions of your resume. One that's five pages, that's really, really technical, and then one's that, that's uh, like the one-pager or the two-pager. Um, put it up there, put, put each of them up there for a week and see which one gets you more callbacks. Why not, right? Um, it's a good way of kind of testing to be able to see, hey, which gains more traction. Kathy. Do you, um, for, for spelling, so can, is there a way for you to do healthcare as one word or healthcare or healthcare two words? Are you able to do that? Um, that's a really good question because from a grammatical st standpoint, I would usually recommend like keeping it consistent. Um, however, what a lot of people will do is they will put it in both ways there. Um, similar to BI or business intelligence, they might put BI in parentheses after business intelligence. But the system will allow you to do that um, online, like to say this or... For business know, intelligence... Because you said I would add another field for business intelligence, mm -hmm. and, but are you able to say this or... Um, and typically it would be like more specifically like in the job description um, or well sorry in your um, in your description of skills you put business intelligence parentheses BI um, and then that typically gets that for healthcare that's a tricky one and I never thought of that about that and how people could spell it differently. Do you have to put it that way on your resume or does your job search tool understand the difference understand those? Smarter ones will typically figure that out. Um, I wouldn't rely on that, though, um, because a lot of times it is very literal in its interpretation of it. Yeah, um, what I will often do is I will often plug in both of those interchangeably in order to be able to find people who are not finding people the first time. You just look at the job description and the terminology. Absolutely. That, fantastic. Yeah, Brian, that's a really good recommendation right there. What was the recommendation? Um, to actually pull it directly out of the job description and match it to that. Yeah, go ahead and back. How, how many uh, words can you search on? Um, I believe that they max out around 10 or so. Um, I will typically try to keep it around four or five. Um, and what I will usually do as a recruiter, because I, uh, you, I, when I worked as a, a, a lot more as a technical recruiter, I would get these crazy job descriptions that had 20 different requirements on them. Um, and so what I would do is I would screen through and I would look for the one or two or three, uh, three requirements that are most rare. Um, and so that might be the way to approach it from a job seeker too. If you're applying for a job that has tons of different requirements, keep in mind a recruiter may not be able to find that person, but what do you think is most relevant to them? What do you think that they're screening for? Yeah. So my other question is we're told not to put our addresses on, mm -hmm. on our resumes. Uh, is a zip code enough? Um, I would put Austin, Texas and then the zip code at the very least um, because this indicates uh, to the recruiter that you are available to work in the Austin area. Um, additionally, if you have only worked other places, so let's say you recently moved. Has anybody recently moved to Austin? Okay, I saw, I saw, see a couple people over there. Um, it's oftentimes a good idea to put a note in there to say specifically, I recently have relocated to Austin and I'm seeking work in the area right here. Um, and that's a good way of doing it because a lot of times what we might get is we might get um, people that uh, are applying for a very high-end technical roles. They actually live halfway across the country and they just put Austin on their um, resume. So, uh, unfortunately as it is. Um, now, based off this information that I plugged in right here, um, it is going to give me a ranking system, if you will. So it's going to deem um, this person on the top right here from Cedar Park an 8.3% match and the second person a 7.7 .7, all the way down to a 4.6. And you'll go through pages of this 
Guess how many, okay, so um, search engine optimization uh, question over here. Um, when people are searching online through Google, how many uh, links do they typically click on or how far does their eyeball go across the page before they land on something? Half, halfway down the first page. About halfway down, uh, that's optimistic. Usually I hear it um, within like the first two or three links, which means that realistically, if I am a recruiter and my HR manager comes to me and says, Miles, you need to find me three people by today or you need to find me this single person today because the client is breathing down my neck, what's probably going to happen is I'm going to look at the first two people first and I may not only look at the first two people. Um, so that's the challenge of it. That's, that's really, really the kind of the crux of the challenge of it is being able to get up in those two slots right there. Because I can already tell you that actually my first choice is uh, based off of looking at these resumes personally is I would choose the second one right there. So this is how it deems it relevant right here. And keep in mind, certain applicant tracking systems may completely disregard other resumes if they are not deemed relevant enough to. So that's an, an important thing. Yeah. Can you tell us why it ranked the top one is 8.3 and the second one is only 7.7? We are. The second one has a master. And, and it's not an exact science. I can't tell you all of it because I can't, like, dissect monsters algorithms, but I can kind of start to break that down. I'm glad you asked that question right here. The second one actually had uh, business intelligence experience, uh, and the, the first one doesn't. It does, yeah, it does. And it probably has to do with um, keyword frequency. Um, they probably thought that my most important thing was looking for a business analyst, and the first resume probably repeated business analysts more frequently. Um, this can be particularly a challenge. Who here has recently exited from a job where they were there for 10 plus years? Okay, that can be really challenging when you've been there for a very long time, right? And then all of a sudden you are competing against these people that have lots more keywords on their resumes just because their resume is longer. What I typically advise in that case is actually breaking it down by role assignments that you did. So, hey, if I was in this particular role and then from this, these years I was in this particular role and this helps add a little bit more length and depth to your resume. Um, don't assume that the recruiter is necessarily going to read into it. That is a nice optimistic uh, outlook on it, but it's not always the case. Um, a lot of times we are very busy and we're screening through many, many resumes to be able to get to, th get to things. Is that kind of what you've experienced too? Yeah. Have you edited your resume similarly? Okay. Okay. Um, sometimes what you can do too is you can break it down by projects as well. So if you worked on a particular project and that helps kind of get a little bit more context in there as well. So. so Miles, yeah. at this point in your search, you haven't even looked at a resume. I've clicked on the first two. Okay. <laughs> I've, yeah, I've, I've clicked on the first two, but these are more just uh, showing you kind of how is deeming it relevant. Yeah, exactly. Go ahead. If you've been passed over uh, for a particular job for somebody like the first two, mm -hmm. does that judgment of your resume stick? No, but typically not. Um, and uh, there's a lot of people that ask me, hey, is it okay if I submit my resume multiple times to the same company? Absolutely. Um, honestly, that shows us that you are really serious about the role. Um, and what I always tell people too is don't ever be afraid. If you feel like that, uh, if that job is a spot on match for you, I would not feel afraid to follow up via phone or email um, as long as you're being polite and not annoying about it. Um, because it, uh, it, laughing back there, but yeah, it is something that we, that we experience unfortunately. Um, but the biggest thing is that be courteous, be polite, um, ask for their time. And it does make you stand out because guess how many people, if I, if I get a job posting up there, guess how many people follow up on their resume? What's that? Zero. Almost zero, yeah. It's um, every once in a blue moon, um, I will get somebody that follows up on their resume. Um, I once had a person that actually sent me a thank you card for talking with her at a job fair. Guess how much that stands out to me. Like, I've never gotten a thank you card for talking to somebody. Yeah, Jill. How quickly after any interaction should they follow up on that resume? I've always waited like two or three days. Just to um, it, that's really kind of a case-by-case -case basis. Um, it depends on how quickly they're remove, moving on the resume. I usually recommend about a week or so um, because it will typically take recruiters at least that long to be able to look at it. Um, a week is polite. Um, two to three might, uh, might seem a little bit pushy depending on the a a agency and how, um, how many resumes they have to sift through at the same time. 
Okay, so inserting your keywords multiple different times, what we're gonna do is we're gonna actually look at my resume. By the way, um, I am not a business analyst, I do not have an MBA, and I am not a certified scrum master. So, I, I know, right? <laughs> did I fool you though? Did I, did I fool you? Um, that's my hope anyway, uh, is to kind of show you a little bit more right here. Um, and what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna actually show you what these keywords look like when they're highlighted in the resume. And keep in mind that this resume that I, uh, that I wrote um, is pretty good, but it could be a lot better, and I want your guys' ideas on how to make it better. So first off right here, we have the objective professional summary right here, which is just talking about all the different things in general that I do as a business analyst. Um, it also has my address and my contact information as well. Then it has technical skills. Anybody ever seen this on a resume before? Yeah. Okay, cool. Um, guess why I might love that. Any ideas? What's that? Uh, exactly. Um, what's that? It's, it's very clear. Um, it, it's easy for me to skim through the resume. It's easy for me to be able to tell. Um, what I often tell people to do is actually it's a good idea to break this down by what are called hard skills and soft skills. Um, hard skills would be like, hey, I have experience with a particular application. Soft skills would be I have experience with leadership or something a little bit more fuzzy. Um, yeah, Kathy. We were always uh, told that uh, systems cannot scan uh, um, Tables. Tables. Charts. Tables, yeah. Uh, for horizontal lines, can't, they can't scan that, that you should not put it in a, in a table, you should have it just with, with you know, uh, the word like comps. And every, every job club actually asked me that too. Um, I get that every single time. No, and it's a really good question. I, um, I got the question so much that I called up the people that make our applicant tracking system and asked them, and they said, I think that that might be a holdover from when they first came out. Um, I don't, if you want to err on the safe side, the easy way to do that is just strip out the particular box and just put it in a text format right there. Um, and that would be definitely the safe way, especially if you're encountering an older applicant tracking system. Um, I don't know if it's necessarily necessary to worry about that on a regular basis, though. Um, but yeah, but basically the really important thing is that this gives me a really clear and easy way if the recruiter is scanning and the most important thing to them is like, hey, do they have business intelligence and do they have SharePoint? Can I skim through this and can I see that they do? Yes, okay, obviously I'm going to spend more time on your resume now as a recruiter. Okay, and finally, we skip to the part of professional experience right here. Um, the, once again, the way that a recruiter's eyeballs typically work, and they've done like tracking systems where they look at a person's eyeballs, typically they start at the top, they look and read like about three words into this part right here, and they say energetic, innovative, self-motivated business analyst, Okay, skip, skip, and then now they look at this right here. Um, that's typically how the eyeballs go. And so this is really the part where you make your impact and show that your relevancy as far as a candidate. Um, typically what will happen is they'll look at this part right here um, and they'll say, oh, okay, so this person has worked as a business, has a, as a business analyst. Um, I see that they actually have those state experience that I'm looking for. And then they bounce back to here and they say, oh yes, they do have the technical skills that I'm looking for as well. So, once again, this is not perfect, but this is a, actually shows a couple of really good examples right here um, where I'm actually saying what I am, so I'm a business analyst, um, I'm saying kind of where I've worked, but then the bottom part right here, I see a lot of uh, folks don't use this right here. This is a really quick and easy way for you to, again, stick in those keywords that are important. So now, instead of saying business intelligence once at the very top, I actually can say it two times, or if I've used it in multiple different roles, I can use it three or four times, and that makes it more relevant. That makes sense to everybody right there? Okay, cool. Um, you can use technology use, you can use like leadership, uh, you can use like um, soft skills use. Um, it just depends on what you think the recruiter might be looking for in this case right here. Okay, so we went through, and now we're going to actually update our summary a little bit. Now, this is the hardest part, and this might be what you're struggling with a little bit, Jill. Do you find that at all? Yeah, it's, it's you know, I, I tweaked my resume the last time to include all of these words. Yep. So now I'm doing it again, and it wants me to tweak it for some different words, but do I need to take these words out, or should I leave them in? You know, trying not to take out stuff that is already in there that's okay. And, that, and what, one yeah. new thing that I, 
heard is, is how many times it will be used. I haven't really understood that part. Because the job scan tool, if I've used the word once and they used it five times, it still puts a check mark by it. It does, yeah, but it deems it more relevant, yeah, when you yeah, use it multiple exactly. times. Um, this part right here is, uh, and I read a lot of very, very long professional summaries, and I can tell you right now that that's not really necessary because, once again, I'm reading the first three or four words um, right here. Um, this is your opportunity to address any objections. Um, I know that we had a couple folks that were actually recently moved to the Austin area, and you already learned that recruiters sometimes will skip over those resumes if they are not entirely sure if they actually reside in Austin. Because keep in mind that if you're going through 250 resumes, you may not have time to give it a second guess or a second doubt or to call the candidate up and ask them. So this is the part where you really kind of go in and address specific questions that may come up. What are some other objections or reasons that a recruiter might pass on your resume? Any ideas? Ms. Milling. What's that? Ms. Milling. Okay, Ms. Milling. Well, specifically more like, um, more like pro uh, professional reasons or things that um, might not necessarily look good on a resume. Any ideas? Yes. What's that? Gaps, yeah, gaps are the gaps are challenging, right? Because um, unfortunately, especially if I'm recruiting for like a highly technical kind of position, and I see that you haven't worked in the last three years, um, I may not consider you for that particular thing. Once again, the best thing that you can do is really use this section right here to explain that a little bit more, um, because everybody's humans at the end of the day. Everybody wants to give you a second chance, um, but a lot of times we just need to have a little bit more story, a little bit more context behind it. So if it's a matter of like, hey, I was uh, taking care of a sick relative, um, I was doing childcare or something like that, it's helpful for us to have that in there. The worst thing is really just seeing a big gap and not any explanation behind it. We want to know what you've been doing in that time. And that's, that's really kind of the crux of it right there. Yeah, John. Um, I heard there's a technique where you can add keywords at the bottom of your resume, but have them in a font that's not legible to the human eye. Um, that is, uh, yeah, so it is uh, back, um, actually, from the early days of search engine optimization, that was how websites used to deem themselves more relevant to Google. They would basically just throw in a bunch of keywords with white font on a white background. Um, and Google would say, hey, obviously this is a fantastic website. Well, it's, um, they've gotten privy to that. They, they, they know what's going on. And here's the bigger thing too, is that if I'm a recruiter and I see you doing that kind of thing, that's kind of gonna be a big red flag for me. Like I'm gonna immediately look at that and say, well, I'm worried about the honesty of this person. I'm worried about them really kind of taking this seriously. Um, I'm worried that they tricked me. So it's, it just doesn't, it's, um, a lot of times like it might come up during the course of like if you're highlighting it or if you're copy pasting it into another document. Yeah, because a lot of times what we'll do is we'll email that resume onto somebody. So we just contr uh, control A or command A everything and then copy paste it into another thing. And then we go, oh, what's all that stuff down at the bottom? So. It just be be wary about that, I and mean, you can do whatever you want, but just be wary about that. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, you have an email just right there. I recently yeah. went somewhere. If you have an AOL email address, mm -hmm. that's really hard. Yeah. Uh, yeah. 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 Ye
Um, for example, we don't, uh, we only hire people on a W-2 basis, and so we're specifically taught to screen out for anybody that would not be able to work on a W-2 basis. Um, and so you would want to um, put in your eligibility to work and just kind of clarify that for any recruiters that are in a similar situation. So yeah, um, corp to corp resumes and whatnot, we get a lot of those. Um, anybody heard of that before? Corp to corp? Okay, so corp to corp is basically when um, I can't work um, uh, in the uh, United States except on a 1099 basis, um, and I'm gonna actually have another company represent me and send my resumes for me. Um, this is something that happens to us a lot. We get hundreds of these every single, uh, every single week. Um, so that's the reason that sometimes it's nice to put that eligibility to work in there. Does that answer the question? Yeah. We're just more interested that you can work uh, in the, the States, especially because most people hire on a W-2 basis. So, yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, Perfect. So that kind of covers this right here. Once again, use this to address any questions that a recruiter might have and try to anticipate what those questions are and then have a brief summary about exactly why you'd be perfect for that role. And I can tell you right now that if I were editing this right here, what might be some of the things, some of the sentences that you would strike from here? Any ideas? What, what would you strike? I would shorten it by at least 50%. What's that? I would shorten it. I would delete yeah. entire entries and then distill the main entries because it's just too much to read. But Stefan, I mean, I've done all of these things. I've, I've, I've worked as a business analyst for 10 years. It's really hard for me to strip all that back down. What would you say to me? Yeah, exactly, exactly. And that's the really the crux of it that is really hard because um, when you have so much experience and so much experience that um, you think might help the company, it's really hard to strip out those might details and keep it down to what's relevant specifically on the job description. Yeah, Jill. Uh, one other recommendation I've seen is to have like a LinkedIn profile link mm -hmm. up to the top. Um, what do you think about that? Oh, like a LinkedIn profile? Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's nothing wrong with that at all um, because a lot of times the way that we use uh, LinkedIn uh, at Peak Performers is we see what questions are not answered in the resume and then go to LinkedIn to see if we can clarify those questions. Um, because a lot of people, how many folks uh, keep a resume that's down to two pages or less? How many of you have been told by every single other recruiter on the face of the planet that this is absolutely necessary? Okay, so I'm seeing a lot of hands right there. Those short and sweet resumes, um, they have a point because um, if you're applying for a public, or sorry, a, like a private sector job, let's say you wanna um, go work for Apple, they may see 250, the recruiter may see 1,000 resumes for a particular job opening. And what they're gonna be doing is they don't have a lot of time, they're gonna be skimming very, very quickly and that's where it can help you out. However, what I always tell people is, once again, keep it relevant. So if your job experience directly ties back to that, I want you to include that, especially on your monster profile, because that means it pops up in more places and is kind of cross-compatible with more different searches right there. So don't short yourself on words in that way. If your more relevant experience is mm -hmm. like a job task, you know, in, uh, and how do you get it out of uh, time work? Uh, oh, like, like out of, yeah, out of, yeah, out of, out of, yeah, you said move the pieces. Yeah, you, you move, move the pieces of your work experience. Okay. To I don't usually recommend that per se, and I almost always recommend um, one of the biggest mistakes that what I regard as a mistake on a resume is when people will start with their oldest work history first at the top of the page and go chronologically down. And then um, the reason that this is a challenge for me is that I might assume that you haven't worked for the last 10 years and there's no explanation for that. Um, at Peak Performance, we typically scan through the whole thing and stuff, and so we probably uncover that and go, oh, this resume is just a little bit different, but you want to avoid that. Um, so do you pull yeah. up like a functional summary uh, at the top and then mm -hmm. the chronological? Um, you, you could do that. Um, what you could also do is really just kind of shorten. So let's say, for example, the last four years, um, you have worked in um, retail um, just as a get-by job, like I need to do this, and then before that, you worked in another retail position, but really your heart and soul is in being a, um, a HR or something like that. Um, what I would do is I would just specifically list those as one lines right there to say what you've been doing in the last couple of years, and then the bulk of your resume is gonna focus on that HR experience that you have. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
to have a higher score if you get more rewards. Yes. Right? So uh, you are likely to have uh, more uh, rewards if you have a larger a longer resume. A longer resume. Yes. So how does it work? I mean, if I if I use a a long CV and you you are able to find out that it has like a over maybe over eighty five percent or ninety percent, mm -hmm. uh, I mean if it's uh, maybe too long and instead of two is three or four, mm -hmm. what do you do? Do you do you still uh, go farther and ask maybe for something shorter? Or <laughs> I usually. It depends on the agency. Um, typically, I will go and actually ask people for longer resumes, um, to be honest with you, because public sector's work, they um, are very focused on the hard technical skills and the experience that you have. Um, what I would do, and what, here's what I typically recommend, is that um, try it both ways. Um, see which one gets you more bites. See which, uh, do like the A-B testing, kind of like we were talking about before, and see which one has more results for you. I usually recommend um, for Monster and Indeed and all those <laughs> ones that you post a longer version of your resume, um, just because it's going to be more cross-sect with more different keywords. Yeah. Does that answer your question? Yes, I was doing the that because when I just scan, <laughs> it's very clear when I use the longer one, yep. the, the one that has a what happens from the other part, from the other side? What are the is not a high score, but And the risk that you encounter, just like you're saying right there, is that a recruiter, reason they say, oh, this person is spot on, um, they print off the resume or they email the resume over to their um, HR hiring manager, um, and the hiring manager says, um, anybody heard the phrase uh, TLDR? Mm -hmm. Uh, yeah, I'm hearing some people right there. It's uh, pretty common, like uh, uh, too long, didn't read. Um, so that is the risk that you run into. So it's always a balancing act between those two different things of optimizing for the resume and optimizing for the human being too. Um, most of the time though, if the recruiter takes the time to print off your resume, the HR manager is probably going to give it a decent look. Usually, yeah. Go ahead, in the back. Um, I'm curious how recruiters look at people who have been entrepreneurs and then are looking to get back in the job market and how to structure your resume to kind of reflect why you, you know, explain that process. Of okay. And I'm going to repeat that too. Um, so that was a really good question. How do recruiters typically look at folks that um, have run their own business um, and uh, how does that kind of fit in with jobs? Um, the answer to that question is that it can be tricky, and I know that from personal experience. Uh, I got out of school, uh, actually, and uh, anybody guess what my, uh, what my degree was in? History. What's that? History. History. That's really close, actually. Any other guesses? English. English Lit, you're very close. Creative writing, actually. So I did, wrote a lot of poems, a lot of nonfiction, a lot of memoirs, because as an 18-year-old, you just have so much to contribute to that subject right there. <laughs> um, Anyway, so what I did immediately after getting out of school is I had started my own business um, that was uh, doing digital marketing uh, for small businesses, um, particularly in the area of reputation management. Um, but unfortunately, one, I was 22 years old at the time trying to sell the businesses. Um, two, I launched it in 2008. And everybody knows what a wonderful time of year that was. So I find myself in a similar kind of position where I was actually trying to figure out how to modify that content and make it relevant for the kinds of jobs that I was looking for. Um, typically, um, small businesses that get less resumes will be more um, open to that kind of thing, um, and so that might be a good place to start. Um, larger businesses, um, typically they're looking for more of a um, obvious choice of, as far as a candidate goes, so your best strategy might be focusing on the smaller businesses, actually. Um, but some businesses look at that as a positive, as a positive too. Yeah. Somebody said they would cut this by 50%, but I really like a lot of the content depending on what jobs are applying for. Right. Um, I'm wondering if you might also want to tie in one or two um, stellar incidents where you were able to produce incredible results using some of this because most of this is kind of Absolutely. You bring up a really fantastic point. Um, and what John was saying right there is that my resume is extremely focused, and we're going to actually um, skip over to this part right here. It's extremely focused on my technical skills and the experience that I have, and doesn't really focus on projects. Um, 
It depends on the organization that you're applying to and what they're going to be looking for. Um, working in the public sector, we're looking for very straightforward. Um, we're looking for specifically like, hey, does this person have three years of experience doing this so we can check a box and then therefore submit it onto the client. Um, typically in the private sector, they are more, um, they are more uh, motivated by results. So have they achieved 50% year over year growth in blankety blank kind of thing. Um, so it just depends on your audience. Yeah. If a person has a section at the top of the resume with just a few accomplishments, mm -hmm. uh, does that throw it off because it's not a regular chronological listing of work experience? Um, not necessarily. I have seen people do that. Um, and uh, yeah, that so actually. Scan okay. Yeah, it's going to scan fine. Um, it might. Um, I don't, I don't think that that would be a problem as far as scanning it into the uh, applicant tracking system. Um, I haven't usually seen that. Usually it's smart enough to figure that out. Okay. Mind. Sorry. Yeah, go ahead. So one technique I've used is to take uh, what I call a showcase position. Yeah. Maybe it was five years ago, but it relates directly to the job. Put that on the top with the okay. title showcase position. Yeah. And it's out of sequence. Okay. Is that going to be a problem? As long as I put the dates and then it's also listed in the chronological. I usually prefer seeing it in a directly chronological way myself. Um, I usually don't like it when it skips around because it makes it harder for me, but a lot of that's personal preference. Um, what I would encourage you, try it both ways. See what gets you more calls. Okay. Yeah, try it both ways. Um, Okay, finally we're going to talk about moving, oh yeah, sorry, go ahead. And just a, an alternate way that um, I think might work is in the initial description, if you just say previously one or two words of that job title, Okay. and then, you know, your other relevant facts as part of your initial job description, that at least highlights the fact that yes, you may have been a few years ago, but you've had that job. Is that work? Maybe, I'd have to see it in context, to be honest with you. I, I'm having trouble, I, I think I'd have to see that, yeah. You know, the current years have been, you know, doing shopping and dishwashing and all that, but in your initial description, you say, I was previously a project manager. Yeah. yeah. Um, personally, I prefer to just read it as a chronological thing, and I will skim through all the way to see, look at job titles at the very least. That really boils down more to actually um, kind of my next speaking topic that I'm going to be doing next year is uh, talking about focus of your resume um, because really you have to pick one kind of thing and really focus heavily on that. Um, the hardest part for a recruiter to encounter is ambiguity. Um, anytime that they encounter a resume in that stack of 250 resumes and they say, I'm not sure, that's probably going to be a no. Um, and that's the challenge of it. Um, but it just really boils down to focusing your resume towards what you want at that given time um, or focusing your resume towards that particular job. So be that functional or technical. Yeah. Um, and then finally, we're going to talk about moving pieces around right here. Uh, so for example, in my, uh, in my demonstration right here, I have an MBA, obviously. Um, and uh, I'm very proud of that uh, MBA. Uh, who here is an MBA in the room? Okay, and that probably wasn't necessarily cheap, was it? Uh, yeah, and you're very proud of the work that you did, but the challenge is that on my job description, I'm not asking for that. I'm not asking for that. And the biggest challenge that I get is that if people recently went back to school, they're extremely proud of that, and so they'll put the education front and center, and sometimes the work experience gets bumped down to the second page. And now all of a sudden I'm going to be skipping over that resume right there. So look at the job description, see what's relevant, and then tailor it accordingly. Um, by all means, you should include it, but maybe that goes towards the bottom of the page. And then finally, minimize and remove extra content. This is kind of going back to what we were talking about earlier. Um, if I took a uh, fallback job for a little while, working retail, working food service, or something like that, because I needed to put gas in the tank, um, 
just all it needs is a line. Uh, recruiters are going to understand that, um, especially like if you were hunting in a particularly hard job time, um, or if you have an extremely specialized set of skills. A lot of times, just a single line saying what you did and where, and that gives us the knowledge of knowing, hey, what you've been doing. You don't want to leave that part blank, but just minimize the content and focus on what you really want to focus on. Okay. Whew. That was a lot of stuff. I hope that you guys are uh, doing okay right here. Um, I know that we're running a little bit low on time right here, but I want to just hit back on the main points. Tailor your resume to the specific job. Make your resume skimmable. Optimize for keywords. And spend your time applying for the right roles. Um, I often encourage... Anybody ever use that Indeed one-click button or something like that? What's that? Uh, Indeed, where you click the one button, one button to apply? Yeah. Okay, so the challenge with that is that if it's as easy for you, Alfonso, to do that, that means that it's also super easy for a thousand other people to do it as well. So I encourage people to spend the time, tailor their resume specifically for the job, and spend the majority of your time looking for the job that's going to be a spot on match for you because the recruiters are looking for an obvious choice.